Let's talk about how light interacts with one of the most important materials in the world, glass, SiO2. So glass does a lot of things for us. It makes a great container because glass is chemically inert. It also makes a great container because it's a terrible thermal conductor. You can have something that's hot and in a container of glass and you can hold it. Um, also, because it's transparent to the eye. That's what we care about in optics. It allows light to pass through mostly at the wavelengths uh, that our eye can detect. Sometimes it has a little bit of a color to it. That can be on purpose or on accident. It depends on what um, other elements are in the glass. If it's pure silicon and oxygen, then it's completely transparent. If it's got some soda lime glass, it has a little sodium, a little um, uh, calcium in it, then it's still pretty much transparent. But if you get iron and chromium and other elements in there, you can start to make colors. You can do it on purpose to make colored glass, or in this case, this is a bottle I found in the Nimmo closet. It's so old, this may just be the best glass they could make at the time. So it's a great container, very important to chemistry. Imagine how hard it would be to have, for chemistry to have developed without having glass uh, vials and flasks. It can also be used for optics. It can be ground into different shapes, different curves, which lets us focus light. So you can imagine where would optics be if we didn't have glass to make lenses. So it's very important to the history of science and all of science and technology. Here's something I just found in the demo closet that was very important to use for glass. It's some vacuum apparatus. I actually have no idea what this is. I hope it's not hot. Let me get rid of it. And by hot, I don't mean stolen. Glass is also a good structural material. It's actually very strong. We think of it as fragile, and that's partly because it breaks in such an exciting way. But also, we usually make very thin structures because it's so strong. So like a light bulb has to hold a lot of pressure. Light bulbs inside are usually at reduced pressure. And you can do that with a very thin amount of material because it's so strong. And you don't even worry about it breaking. So I hold this light bulb right next to my face. I don't even worry about it, right? So let's think about why it's transparent and what's going on in terms of optics. So we're going to be a little bit more general. And we're going to talk about light in a dielectric. And by that, I mean a material basically with no free electrons. So a conductor or a metal would have free electrons. A dielectric is simply an insulator, a material with no free electrons. So glass is a dielectric. Other crystalline materials are also dielectrics. So here, we're not just focused on glass, but we'll get to glass's properties at the end. So let's think about this dielectric. And just to contradict my excitement over glass, I'll draw it as a crystalline material. These are the atoms in some material. Maybe it's crystalline, maybe it isn't. It doesn't really matter. The key is it's a dielectric. And let's think about light we know is an oscillating, oscillating electric field. So there's the amplitude of some sinusoidal oscillation of light, basically a plane wave, and it's going to strike this material. So we're going to think about this microscopically. We have the E field this way. We have the K vector this way. And we're just going to consider the E field because the interaction of light with most ordinary types of matter, like a dielectric, is mostly due to the E field. The B field's effect are not quite as big. Okay? So let's say light is an oscillating um, electric field to each atom. So we could write that as E naught E to the minus J omega T, which looks like the plane wave. And we've removed the spatial part because we're right now just going to think of each atom at one point in space. So to that atom, it's just the E field going by, oscillating in time. So we can leave out the spatial part. OK, so let's see. The, what's going to happen? Well, we imagine there's a little proton, positively charged protons in the middle, electrons flying around the outside. They're both going to feel a force to the electric field, but the protons are really heavy. So they don't accelerate as much. They don't move as much. It's really the light electrons that are pushed around. So let's just think about the electrons. The electrons feel a force. So we can apply Newton's second law to the electrons. Let's see. So if the electron is pushed away from its uh, 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 nuclear charged 
uh, between the, from the charged nucleus will be pulled back. That's kind of like a spring force. So we can write minus K R. We call it K because it's kind of like a spring. We'll call it capital K to make it clear. We don't mean literally a little Hooke's law spring. We just mean something that behaves kind of like a spring. And then uh, minus Me, the mass of the electron, times gamma times dr dt. That's the damping force. So when we think of a macroscopic oscillator with a dash pod and oil that has damping. But even at the microscopic scale, there are mechanisms that give you damping that are also proportional to the velocity. One is radiation. As an electron oscillates, it radiates energy away. So it's a kind of like damping. And the other is kind of like friction at the atomic scale. When this thing oscillates, it can generate vibrations of the lattice. It can generate heat. So that's similar to the friction you would normally think about. Um, another term then would be minus the electron charge times E naught. And that's just the driving force from the incident light. E to the minus g omega t. It's oscillating, of course. And then finally, ma, the mass of the electron times d to r dt2. So r here is this position vector that describes the position of the electron as it's moving around from its center over the nucleus. So let's go ahead and draw the electron cloud and see what it looks like. So we could say without E naught, it was just happy. Everything was fine. There was a positive nucleus, and the electron cloud, we could imagine for this material, was nicely centered right around the nucleus. But if we apply this field with E naught, and I've drawn it up this way, what would happen? The uh, positive charge would feel a force um, up, right? and the negative charge would feel a force down. So the atomic little system would be perturbed. And I'll draw it highly exaggerated. You would have your positive um, charge end up here, and your cloud deformed where the negative charge is down there. And let's see. So the electrons will move in this way to create what we call a dipole moment. And that is labeled P. So a dipole moment is simply a separation of charge. It usually shows up when you have something that is atomic, some molecular structure that's neutral, but your positive charge gets shifted from your negative charge. You create a dipole moment. In this case, we had a symmetric atom, and the dipole moment was created by the E field. And in some cases, atomic structure or molecular structure can just naturally give you dipole moments. They don't always have to be induced. Some molecules just have a dipole moment. And that's equal, in this case, to minus Q times the position R. And in general, dipole moments are equal to just the charge times um, the position. Every book will define it a little different, and it can be very tricky. Here, we have defined, even though I didn't write it, we have defined R as the position of the negative charge. Okay? So here, the average position of the negative charge was in the center, because it's this circular cloud, and we have perturbed it down. So here, R is down. And we focus on the position of the negative charge, because that's really the one that moves. The heavy positive nucleus doesn't really do much. Okay. So when we write it this way, since we're talking about the position of the negative charge, we have to have a negative here to sort of account for that. So R is the position of negative. And then we have to define Q as the displaced charge magn magnitude, also important. So you don't put negative E here. You don't put a negative fundamental unit of charge here and have yet another negative to keep up with. This is the magnitude of the displaced charge. So if you draw it all that way, you get that the dipole moment is like this. It goes always from the negative to the positive charge when the charge gets separated. 
So many different books will define this in different ways. It'll be P is QD, negative, not a negative. There's negatives flying everywhere. There's one inside the R. This could be the magnitude or the charge. There might or might not be a negative there. Very confusing. But whatever notation a book uses, be sure you figure out what they mean by all these values. But then know that no matter how they define it, everybody agrees the dipole moment points from, is the vector from the negative to the positive. And its magnitude is how much charge and how much was it displaced. Now, if light comes by, this dipole moment is not static. This dipole moment is going to oscillate. So now we need to calculate or come up with an expression for that oscillation.